Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here, and today I've got another really interesting knife review slash knife overview to show with you guys. This hulking knife <laughs> is the Midgard's Messer Thunrar. Um, which is, I believe, their newest offering. Um, these knives can um, actually be found at, at the time of this recording. If you're watching it at the time that I uploaded it, the day that I uploaded it, they can be found at Tools for Gents, which I will have linked right down below. You guys can check them out if you want. Thank you so much to um, both Midgard's Messer and Tools for Gents for actually uh, providing this knife for review. Really cool. Um, thanks so much to my patrons for supporting me, and please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. This is a big boy. This is a big old thick chunky knife, and because of the profile, it looks like a stubby little tank. But I think it might surprise some of you to find out that the thing actually comes in at about eight inches, about eight and an eighth. It's actually a full-size knife. It's just so tall. The blade length is three and a half inches and your cutting edge is also three and a half inches. How about some size comparisons up against the Ontario Rat Model 1? Wow. <laughs> How about up against the Ontario Rat Model 2? It's like three of these could fit inside of that. It's just crazy. Um, how about up against the Spyderco, where is it? The Spyderco PM2? There we go. How about up against the Spyderco Para 3? Mm, there we go. How about up against the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue, a knife that actually has just about the same overall length, minus maybe a quarter of an inch. So if you have the Ritter Hogue, it's literally about this. It's actually an eighth of an inch longer. Um, it's just way taller. And there it is up against the Benchmade Bug Out. Um, this, is, uh, this is a big boy. Um, how's the action on this guy? So I believe this knife, yeah, I don't know if you can see it. Might be able to, we can put a flashlight in there. This guy actually runs, maybe just, it's kind of it's really hard to see, maybe like that. Can we get in there, there, right there? Runs on bearings. It is very, very smooth. And while it is, you know, once you kind of see that, this is a guillotine. It's not only the weight and mass of the blade, but it's also crazy smooth on the inside. If you don't get your finger out of the way, there's a lot of blade coming down. And if you're, you know, if you're working with a knife that uh, is just really, really smooth, sometimes, you know, it just kind of stops and gives you a little, a little bite, a little warning on your finger. This, this might send you to the hospital. Um, so <laughs> disengaging it with one finger, you can do it. It's a little bit Sharp. I really wish that they had knocked this down a little bit more on the inside. It's not that big of a deal. There's a little bit of a cutout and plenty of space to approach it from the side. There's also no double clutch because that flipper tab does come down, thankfully, and safely hit your uh, thumb so that you have opportunity and opportunity to move your finger out of the way. This is one of those that's kind of like a pinch opener or kind of like, you know, the, the Medford slide, right? You kind of use the fuller. I got to be honest, I really wish that it had a thumb stud. Um, and I think it would have been cool to have the thumb stud maybe in an area like this so that it could wrap around and then maybe have an area carved out right here so that the studs could act as external stops on both sides. That way, you know, the frame could accommodate for it and you could still get it into a pretty good position to fire with a thumb stud. I think that would have been great. Have something, you know, big and oversized to kind of match the theme of this thing. But as it is, opening it with the fuller is absolutely possible and after you get used to it, it's fairly convenient, right? You'll adapt to it. It's just not as convenient as using a thumb stud or a flipper tab or something like that. Um, actually flicking it out, eh, good luck, uh, kind of, right? I mean, you can, you're gonna be messing with it, you know, <laughs> for a while before you actually get it to deploy. Maybe some of you are gonna be better than I am, I don't know. Um, but yeah, not the most convenient thing in the whole world to deploy. Let's go ahead and do uh, carry a profile up against the Spyderco Para 3. Um, holy crap, it is extremely thick. Extremely. Length and height up against the PM2 and the Para 3. This is the most bricky brick knife that I have ever seen. It is very close to a square. Um, <laughs> very, 
very tall, extremely tall, and almost the same body length as the uh, Para 3, just maybe a quarter inch or three quarters of an inch shorter. Um, but the fact remains that you are going to be committing to a lot of knife in your pocket. So maybe those of you who carry like the big overbuilt cold steels, maybe this won't be such an abrupt, like holy crap moment for you. But if you've been used to the Para 3, mm, you better wear a belt. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, let's go ahead and do a hardware check. I'm going to get out my tools as per usual. My tools are very inexpensive and very recommendable. You can find them right down in the section of my description that talks about the tools I use on this channel. The pivot here is, uh, oh, is it? No, it's a T8. I really thought it was a T10. It's just a big pivot. Um, the, the Viking was a, um, uh, a T10. This guy is a T8, and then we, fortunately, we have nice T8 screws. That's really good. You have three, well, you've got three on this side, one on this side, and then two pocket clip screws, which are T6. So there's more than minimal hardware, but the main, you know, the screws that are responsible for holding everything together are T8, and that's what I look for. So I, I really can't complain too much, right? How about weight? What are we looking at for materials? We are looking at CPM D2, which is the same that we saw on the Viking. Now that's gonna bum some people out. CPM D2 is a USA powder steel. Uh, this comes from Crucible and it is not cheap. It's probably not gonna be as expensive as something like 20 CV, M390, stuff like that. You know, if we're gonna talk you know, strictly CPM steels, S35VN, S45VN, blah, blah, blah. But it is definitely more expensive than CPM D2. Is it that much more performance oriented? Hard to say. Reports vary, right? Comparing apples to apples, properly heat treated D2 and properly heat treated CPM D2. CPM D2 is the clear winner in all, you know, if we balance everything out. But apparently it's not that much more performance oriented than D2, right? You can also get steels like CPM S35EN and CPM 20CV in knives that cost less than $100 in some cases, right? So let's, you know, take all that into consideration. Would it be nice if it was a different steel? It's much like I said in the case of the Viking, yes. But we'll talk about that more here in a little bit. CPM D2 and a crap load of it. There's probably enough to make two and a half to three blades and then also a crap load of titanium. These scales, actually... I don't usually do this, but I'm, I'm actually gonna measure the thickness of the scale so you understand how much titanium is actually here. So the thickness of these scales individually, oh my gosh, <laughs> they are, I'm trying to get around the flat. Yeah, wow, they're like, a, they're, they're more than a fifth of an inch, is that right? I'm, I'm trying to grab it to where it's actually on the flat of the, let me see if I can curve this and get, get it properly on camera. Yeah, 199 thousandths. That's a lot of titanium, right? So some of you have already looked up the price. We're going to talk about it, but that is a lot of titanium. And normally I don't say just because it's bigger doesn't mean that it's worth more money, but this is a lot of additional material, right? Um, so yeah, I don't know, you know, um, a lot of titanium. We also have, to my knowledge, where is the, a titanium backspacer and titanium pocket clip. Titanium, 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 and a crap load of D2. Has it been milled out? Nope. <laughs> this is gonna be a heavy knife. I'm gonna guess that it weighs at uh, 11 ounces, maybe 12. Ah, almost, yeah. Exa almost exactly the same as the Viking, which is actually right here. The other, another knife, and it's almost identical. Big, big knife. You are dedicating to a lot of object, like just the size of it and also the weight of it. There's just a lot here. How thick is the blade? Um, let's let's do that real quick. I think it's uh, approaching a quarter of an inch. I know the blade's slightly thicker than the scales. Yeah, 235 thousandths. Very close to a quarter inch. It's thick, no matter how you how you look at it. All right, let's get into the meat and potatoes here. This is a fun thing to hold. Um, it actually is a little more comfortable than it looks thanks to some heavy chamfering back here. 
and you get a nice lock-in, right? If you're gonna use a knife like this to work with or just to cut your Amazon packages open that likely contain other knives, um, then, you know, yeah, it, it'll do it. The position of the pocket clip looks like it's out of the way. It's not a hot spot, but it's a weird thing to have at the back of the hand. I can't say that it's bad, but I also can't say that it's the most comfortable thing in the world. It's not quite as satisfying to hold as the Viking, but it is definitely satisfying. Picking this thing up and gripping it, you're just like, oh yeah. Everybody, all of my friends here locally that I have handed this knife to, they all have exactly the same reaction, right? Whether they love or hate the way that it looks, when they hold it, it just, it puts a smile on their face. And I know that a lot of you right now are watching that and you have the same smile on your face. You catch yourself and try to stop smiling? I know you're smiling. Yeah, that's what happens when you pick something like this up. It's just ridiculous. It's fun. And that's honestly the reason that so many people are going to find this interesting. Not everybody, but some people are going to find it interesting just because it is such a big, crazy, overbuilt object. And I mean that. This one is definitely overbuilt, even in the lock. Um, the uh, titanium looks really good. To my knowledge, there is only this light blue anno. They don't do any other colors. I really wish that they would do a bronze and they would do it just like a plain stone wash. But I think at the moment they only do this blue, which looks good. It's kind of like oversized golf ball texturing, but it looks nice. By the way, who makes this? Did I mention it? I can't remember if I did. It's concept. So Midgard's Messer Knives, uh, the company is based in Germany and their fixed blades, which are, oh, oh my gosh, they sent me a video of one of their fixed blades and I just, it's amazing. Like they they basically made, like it, it literally looks like one of the knives, that, one of the swords that Kratos uses. The Blades of Chaos, oh my gosh, it was crazy. Those things are made in-house, custom, all in-house Germany. These, the designs come from the guy behind Midgard's Messer, uh, but they are actually manufactured by concept. This information was given to me freely by the gentleman who runs the company. Um, so they're not trying to hide that or anything like that. These are manufactured by concept. And it feels like a concept. And by that, I mean it, it feels like it was made very, very well. The machining is all very precision. This is definitely a, um, definitely a premium knife. It just takes on this sort of clunky, almost caveman, you know, look, but it's intentional. They made this thing intentionally this way. It's just a lot more comfortable than you would think, but it is like holding on to a big comfortable rectangle. That really is what it makes me think of. There's a lot of jimping back here. It's actually nowhere near as aggressive as you might think because they knock some of those corners down. Once again, we have a nice semi-reflective tumbled finish, which I think is appropriate for this knife. We have a really cool full, this, this blade shape is awesome. This is the shortest, stumpiest clip point I have ever seen. It is the only clip point I've ever seen where I can actually say, yeah, you know what? I think that tip probably is very durable. <laughs> no sharp edges here up on the spine though. I wouldn't doubt that you could still strike flint off that if you wanted to. The uh, blade is done very, very well. And it does, it, you know, even though it drops so far, it is still fairly thick at the edge, especially up here. This is still, it's kind of a tanto, tanto clip point. So can it slice? There's no way it can slice if it's that thick, right? Yeah, actually it'll slice pretty well. It's, you know, surprising. Honestly, it's really surprising that this thing can do that, but it can, right? I mean, any geometry can become sharp. Any steel can become sharp. The sharpness of the steel, if you're new to the knife world, is not, you know, that's not the thing that people obsess over. It is the composition's ability to um, maintain its edge and how easy, it's the balance of that relationship with, you know, how easy is it to sharpen? How tough is the edge, right? Due to not just the composition, but the geometry that it, you know, the form that it takes. And then how stainless is it? This is a big, tough blade that is not quite stainless. And because it is CPMD2, it'll actually hold a decent edge. And my God, will that edge be tough. <laughs> Um, let's talk about the extra feature here, and that is the secondary lock. So we have a frame lock, and this frame lock will absolutely, I don't normally do this, but you know, we got the, you know, if, if it's overbuilt, it's got to survive abuse that's far beyond what anyone would rationally use a knife for, right? So, okay, fine, right? So this frame lock is absolutely still going to hold up to stuff like this. It's not going to disengage, right? 
Sorry, I got the old stuff over the table. It'll do that, right? I mean, that right there is already beyond what you should normally use a knife for, right? But, you know, I guess if you're going to go out to prove something to somebody about whether or not it can survive a baseball bat swing to the spine, right? Okay. Um, but if you really want to make sure that that's not going to disengage, and really, you know, when it comes down to it, like a frame lock's ability to do that, it's just proper geometry. A frame lock is generally a good locking system. It's going to hold up to natural use, and in some cases beyond natural abuse, uh, natural use into the category of abuse if the geometry of that lock face and its relationship to the blade tang is good, right? And this is good. Concept knows how to do that. And there is a lot of surface contact here. You can see right there we're locking up at something like 30%, maybe 25 to 30%, which is fine. Once it's locked out, you can take this pin right here, which goes all the way through. And this makes it to where even if for some reason the frame lock moves out of the way, the, the the knife cannot disengage, right? Now, it's not nearly as convenient, right? When we're talking about massively overbuilt locks, and I know the triad lock's gonna come up down there, and that's fine. I'm not comparing this to the triad lock. Um, but when it comes to, you know, these types of knives that have these aggressively overdone locking systems, obviously a pin that you um, have to bring with you is nowhere near as convenient as something that just has the system built in and naturally engages while you're using the knife. But you do have the option to bring this pin with you, and fortunately they put a little hole in it, which means you can attach this to a key ring, which is about the most convenient way to do that. Once that thing is, and you can also lock it into the closed position so it can't open. I don't know why you'd do that, but if you wanted to, you could. And if it gets stuck, they've done a little flathead sort of thing right there so that you can use a tool to get it out of there. Um, yeah, if you really did want to abuse this thing, they have made it in a way that will allow for that, right? It's not going to be the most convenient thing in the world, but it'll do it. Um, still, you know, it, there is no, you know, when it comes down to, you know, true, like the most durable thing that you can use for, you know, stuff that it really goes outside of the parameters of knife use and into the parameters of, you know, there's lots of other tools that are specifically made for this use, right? <laughs> a fixed blade is going to be better, but when that argument br gets brought up, usually the right answer is just use a pry bar or an axe, right? That's usually, the whole argument is kind of nonsensical, right? Because the, the correct tools have been around for a long time. But, you know, yeah, for anybody wondering, that lock is definitely very strong on this. I like how this looks. I like how the blade looks. I like how the handle looks. It's just cool. This is such a big, crazy, angry rhinoceros knife. It, it just looks awesome. And it also looks like it's very deserving of the name Thunrar. It just, it looks like a Thunrar, right? It looks <laughs> Midgard's Messer Thunrar. That's what it looks like. I could, that would have been in my top 10 guesses before I even knew anything about the company, right? That's what it looks like. Um, I like it. Everything's done well. The fit and finish is awesome. Uh, nothing feels clunky or poorly done. They didn't cut any corners. I mean, well, they like physically cut corn, this. That's my attempt at a joke. Um, yeah, but uh, it, it looks good. I like it. There's a gigantic lanyard hole. There's a glass breaker. I'm sure that it would break glass without the glass breaker, honestly. Um, there's a little bit of jimping back here, right? Um, these are numbered. These are limited. So this is number 93 of 200. If you're wanting to pick one of these up, they only did 200 of them. So there you go. The backspacer covers the entirety of the back. And... You know what's funny? Even with that backspacer there, it's still balanced right behind the pivot, right in this area right here, so that's fine. I think it's a good idea that they did this because you would otherwise very easily be able to touch the blade. I didn't touch on that much on the Viking, right? You technically can... No, you know what? You can't. They've elongated this backspacer here, but I think that's a good idea on knives like this is just to do a big, you know, gigantic thick backspacer so you just can't get in there. Pocket clip has the same texturing as the front of the knife. I don't know why they didn't do the texturing on this side. I really wish that they would have, but they didn't. It's no big deal. This has, it's got a ramp, but most of the tip is just a thick block of titanium. Getting this up and over your pocket seam is going to be a little bit of a mess. Once it is there, there is basically no chance that this is coming out of your pocket. There is quite a bit of knife that's, that hangs out. Um, this is essentially a shallow carry clip, but the, the knife itself is so big and so heavy, you know, 
it's not going to come out. You're going to have a lot hanging up out of your pocket, right? Some might mistake this for something else. I mean, it really doesn't look like a pocket knife, right? It looks like something else. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll stay there for sure. At least this area is smooth. There is um, a steel lock bar insert doubling as the over travel stop. So that's good. Um, the lock up is ridiculously solid. If we look in there, you can actually see that stop pin backed up against that uh, lock bar or the, the backspacer right there. There is not a hint of blade play whatsoever. There is nothing. There's also no lock stick up, down, left. There's no lock, there's no lock stick. There's no up, down, left, or right play or anything like that. And then we have no pivot lash. There's a little bit of friction on the lock bar. Not really though. Do I even want to? Not really. Just the slightest bit. It's a, uh, it's a, um, you know, steel lock bar insert. So I'm sure that if there is any, it'll smooth itself out. No pivot lash and a nice, you know, what you'd expect for the detent. And it also has, I think, it might be slightly off center. This is a brand new one. I think it might be slightly off center because of how much I've been playing with it. So we didn't do this for the Viking, but let's go ahead and do it for this guy and see if I can bring that guy back to center. Tighten both of these up here real quick. And it looks pretty darn good. It's a, It's ever so slightly favoring this side. I probably could adjust these screws and get it, you know, just the way that I want it. But, you know, as it is, it's it's fine. The action is still, still falling shut. It's tight. I probably could get that centered. I'm tempted to try. It's close enough though. I still want, you know, something this expensive, I still want them to come perfectly centered from the factory. But, you know, if yours isn't centered, if it's like this one, I'm just looking at it off camera. If yours is ever so slightly off center, there is a trick, right? You pull everything out. Well, you don't pull it out, but like this one's favoring this side just a little bit, right? So we would pull, we would uh, back this pivot out a little bit. We'd back these body screws out just a little bit. Take a piece of paper, wedge it over, crank the pivot down all the way, right? Until you can't move it at all, like ultra stiff, beyond what you would normally tighten it to. Then tighten down these body screws, then pull the piece of paper out, and then slowly get that pivot back to where it's got like a normal, right? Where it's like moving in a way that's not, you know, it's not ultra stiff. And what it should do is center the blade back up. That usually solves the problem. Um, anyways, um, so what is my, what do I think about this knife? Can I recommend it? Um, well, they come in at $350, which is pretty high. We could, I think we could argue this or that about the CPM D2 thing. I think most people who are interested in buying this knife and spending money in this territory are just going to prefer a steel that is perceived, you know, in some cases it's justified, but it just, it's just perceived as more premium. And even if it's, even if it's marginal, right? S35EN, S45EN, uh, or LMAX, same thing that I said for the biking. I think CPM D2 is just not something that the community, and, and honestly, I'm in there too, despite what I know about CPM D2, right? I like the balance of steels like S35VN, S45VN, and LMAX better anyway. It's nice to get that benefit of stainlessness and still maintain some good toughness and good edge retention, right? The geometry of this blade alone is just going to benefit in the toughness department, uh, it's just going to stack on there in the toughness department, but I think it would it would feel a little bit better. You know, if I were to spend $350 on this, it would, it would make me feel a little bit better. Let me be really clear. If you like big, hulking, overbuilt knives, you do not have a lot of options, right? You have the obvious, we have Medford, and you're going to pay a crap load of money. I mean, you know, to be fair, those are made in the United States. You have those, right? But if you true, if you really, truly want, like, massively overbuilt knives, because there's, there's very little on the market right now with, you know these big, crazy, thick titanium scales and big, crazy, thick blade stocks in a folding knife, um, then you're going to like this knife. You will. It's going to scratch that itch for you. If you are not big into overbuilt knives, then there's just no way for you to see the value in this. Do I think the price is fair for a big overbuilt knife? $350 does not blow me away. In fact, it doesn't really excite me all that much. Um, I think I would be a lot more comfortable if if this were, especially if it were S45VN or LMAX. Um, so it's really cool and you don't have a lot of options, right? 
I think a lot of people are going to go, you know what? It's fine. I'm going to go for it because I just want to know what that big old chunky tanky boy feels like. And uh, you're probably going to like it, right? Not a knife that I can legitimately recommend to the vast majority of people watching right now, but it is cool. For the same reason that the Viking made my favorite knives of all time playlist, this one is going to make it too. I love overbuilt knives. I just do. That playlist is reserved for my own personal, like, I just like it because I like it, right? There's a separate playlist for knives that I legitimately recommend to, you know, basically everybody, right? Um, this is very much like specific interest. So that's what I think. I think it's really cool. If you like big overbuilt knives, you don't have a lot of choices. You'll probably like this one. Thanks again to Midgard's Messer for sending this in for me to take a look at. Please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.